Yesterday, J.R. told us that questions are, are so important. They're all important. They direct your life. And so what I'm going to be sharing here this morning is, is uh, it, it's, it addresses, I think, what is one of the most important questions, in fact, the most important question we can ask. And that is, what is your mental picture of God? What's your conception of God? Uh, how you conceive of God, what really happens in your head when you think about God? I'm not asking what your theology is, but what actually goes on in your head um, when you think about God, or when you pray, or worship, uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 it's the most fundamental variable that sets the direction and sets the quality of our life. Uh, the beauty of your relationship with God will never outrun the beauty of your conception of God. And the beauty of your life will never outrun the beauty of your conception of God. Uh, we always take on the image of the God that we worship. So if you have a, if you have a mediocre picture of God, you're going to tend to have a mediocre kingdom life and probably have a mediocre relationship with God uh, because anyone who saw what you see when you think about God would feel mediocre. Uh, it, the question is, how, how beautiful is your conception of God? And I want to submit to you this morning that if your conception of God doesn't feel too good to be true, then you're shooting far too low. Your conception of God ought to contrast with this mediocre world, which conditions us to be mediocre, and so it ought to feel too good to be true. And if it does feel too good to be true, just let that be a reminder to you that you're heading in the right, right direction. Because the truth is that however beautiful you conceive of God, he's infinitely more beautiful than that. So it ought to feel too, too good to be true. Um, and, and, and so I'm going to be addressing our mental conception of God and uh, more specifically addressing a problem that I bet all of us have had with our mental conception of God. And that is, what do we do with the violent, not beautiful conceptions of God that are there in uh, the Old Testament? I want to say this also. I frequently don't have a clue what's going on. That's nothing new. And so coming here, I somehow got in my head that the plenary session would be first and then the workshop second. And so I plan on, on laying the foundation for everything on the, in the plenary session and then looking at particular text in the uh, workshops. But it was reversed. And I can't deal with particular passages unless I laid the foundation, kind of the paradigm I'm going to I'll be proposing here. So for those of you who are in the workshop, but some of this is going to be overlap, all right? So just, there'll be some new stuff, but some of it's going to be overlap, so just be patient. But it's the kind of thing that maybe is worth hearing twice. Uh, in fact, for some of you, it's three times because you came to both seminars, which I don't understand. But uh, <laughs> so the whole conference is me giving the same speech. <laughs> That's got to be exciting. So imagine this, I start off a cross vision, and what I'm sharing here comes out of uh, two books. One is uh, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, they were both published last year. And Crucifixion of the Warrior God is a two volume work, it's 1500 pages, and it's academic. And then the popular version is called Cross Vision, it's about 250 pages I think, somewhere around there. Um, so I am here going to be giving a 30 minute talk on a 1500 page work. Fortunately I talk very fast. But uh, it's just going to have to skim the surface, all right? And, and then basically this is one big infomercial for the book, right? So that's, that's the most I can do. I'll give you a teaser. So I start off the book at Cross Vision this way. I've been married for 39 years. Uh, yeah, hmm? she, she's a very lucky lady. Very, very. 39 years to, to Shelly. And Shelly is the, this is one of, these, one of the kindest people you'll, you could ever meet. Uh, compassionate gentle, um, authentic, uh, she's just true blue. Uh, so imagine I'm walking downtown, downtown St. Paul or Wichita, but let's go with St. Paul because that's where she lives, and um, I see her on the other side of the street. I'm just down there for some reason or other. I see her on the other side of the street, and I try to get her attention, but let's go with me here. The, the, the traffic's too busy and too loud, and she doesn't hear me or see me. So I just kind of fondly watch her on the other side of the street. And I figure I'll, I'll, I'll walk with her up until the time where we get a crosswalk, and then I can cross over and, and get to her. So I'm watching her from the other side of the street with loving eyes. And I see that she's coming upon a panhandler. Looks like a, maybe a war veteran or something. He's wearing a war veteran cap. He's in a wheelchair. Uh, he's selling, you know, pencils with flags on the top of it kind of thing. Uh, or not selling, just asking for donations. And so I see Shelly approaching this guy. And I'm thinking, oh, I know Shelly. You know, she's, she just has compassion to a fault. She'll probably give the guy more money than we can afford to give him. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what I love about her. 
So imagine if I, as I'm watching her and she's approaching this man, all of a sudden, instead of putting money in the jar and talking to the guy for a while, uh, she takes off his cap, slaps him in the face, throws it in the air, and then, then knocks over his pencils and spits on him and then runs. Now, what, what, what should I do with that? Um, oh, how, how do I make sense out of this? Until I can sit down and say, honey, what was going on? Until I can do that face to face, my choices are this. I could, on the one hand, say, gosh, 39 years of marriage and you think you know somebody? <laughs> Turns out she's got this mean streak in her. <laughs> she's probably been sneaking out every Friday afternoon to go abuse panhandlers. <laughs> I could think that. But to even suspect that feels unfaithful. It feels disingenuous. It feels, it's like I'm willing to call into question the covenant that I have with my wife and the years we've had together. I'm willing to say that all of that was not really all authentic because it's a part of you that I didn't know. It, feel, it feels like I, I'd be betraying her to even entertain the possibility that she actually was acting cruelly towards this panhandler. So my other option would be to say, I trust Shelly. I trust her character. I know her character. And therefore, something else must be going on here. Something else is going on. And if I knew there's something else, it would explain this behavior. And it would reveal that, in fact, she was not being cruel, even though it looked that way. So maybe I, I, I would entertain scenarios just to kind of alleviate the cognitive dissonance that's in my brain. Maybe uh, uh, she's part of a social experiment. She got recruited, and, and there's, 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 uh, there's folks that are observing how people respond to uh, someone who was acting this cruel in public. Maybe it's a social experiment. Or maybe it's, it's one of those reality TV shows where, you know, cameras are capturing everyone's horrified look on their, on their face as my wife acts so bizarrely. Maybe, maybe it's a reality TV show and I'm being punked. And they'll all be laughing at it in two weeks when it's on television as they capture my horrified face. Now, those seem implausible, but compared to the idea that my wife could actually be cruel, they're very plausible. The plausibility of any scenario has got to be based on what are the alternatives. Uh, something else must be going on. This is, I think, the kind of situation we find ourselves in uh, when it comes to knowing God through Jesus Christ and in the context of the whole Bible. I, I'm going to suggest to us that if we trust, really trust, that Jesus is the full revelation of God, then we must suppose that when we find portraits of God in the Old Testament, and some would say in the New Testament too, but I'm going to let, lay that aside. Uh, there's been a number of books written on that that, that I, I don't want to cover that ground. I'm sticking to the Old Testament here. And, and uh, if we really trust Jesus, we have to assume that there's something else going on when God is depicted as acting in ways that seem very contrary to Jesus. The way the New Testament presents it is that Jesus reveals this God of outrageous love. He says, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Ah, I like that. But I say unto you, um, turn the other cheek. Uh, never ex don't resist the evildoer. Don't resist in force. Don't respond in kind. Rather, turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. And then he says, love your enemies. Uh, pray for those who despitefully use you. Do good to those uh, who, are, who oppose you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. So this is the criteria that Jesus sets uh, for qualifying as a child of God. You love like the Father loves. And then Jesus says the Father, he causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked. In other words, the Father loves indiscriminately. The sun doesn't pick and choose who it's going to get warm, and the rain doesn't pick and choose who it's going to get wet. It just falls. So also, God is love. He just loves. And we reflect the fact that we're his children, that we're born from him, that we've got this imperishable seed in us, that we've got his DNA in us. We reveal that when we love like that. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't get to not love. And believe me, sometimes that is really tough. I'm in a season right now where there's a guy in my life who I have to love. I don't get to hate him. <laughs> Man, it'd be so easy to. But uh, yeah, you, 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 you love indiscriminately. We're to be like this because God is like this, right? John sums up the whole gospel when he says that God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And then he says, here's how we know what love is. 
which is so good. He gives us a definition. Because always people just fill in the meaning of love, whatever they want to fill it in with. But the, the scripture gives us a very objective, clear definition by pointing us to the supreme example of it. And, and so John says, here's how we know what love is. First John 3, 16. Here's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, so also we should lay down our life for one another. So God is this cross-like love. Love isn't just a verb that God does, and sometimes doesn't do. No, it's the noun that he is. So, so God is self-sacrificial love, cross-like love, all the way down to the core of his being. That's, that, that, that's who he is. Which means that Jesus isn't just one revelation among others. This is so important here. Some people read the Bible like a flat book, where everything is equally authoritative. Um, and so Jesus, in this view, would reveal part of what God's like, but God also has this mean streak that comes out once in a while. Or maybe he was just in a real bad mood back then or something, but, but Jesus just isn't the full revelation of God. He's one picture alongside all the other pictures. And so people take all the pictures of God in the Bible, and, and they sort of squish them all together, and that's their picture of God. And they cover over the whole thing by saying mystery. Uh, oh, it's just a mystery in such a way we don't understand, and we have to put up with it. But see, but... If you read the Bible that way, I don't think you're reading the Bible biblically. There's a difference between a cookbook and uh, a detective novel. A cookbook, it doesn't matter where the recipe is, it, it means the same thing, right? But in a detective novel, where something is, is all important. Have you ever seen like the Book of Eli uh, or, or uh, The Sixth Sense? Have you seen those movies? Okay, so, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, the last minute of both of those shows completely reframes everything. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you see it at the end and you go, what? And then you gotta watch the whole movie again to see how it makes sense in light of the end. That's how the Bible is. It all is pointing in one direction. Uh, and when Jesus shows up, he gives a radical reframe about everything that, that, that uh, preceding him, uh, everything that led up to him. It's a, it's a complete reframe. So we find things like this. Uh, I have 60 pages on this in Crucifix of the Warrior God. I'm going to give you 20 seconds worth. Hebrews 1 says, in the past, in the past, the past. <laughs> I stutter even when I write. <laughs> Actually, I had 12 years of speech therapy to get over my stuttering. Isn't that amazing? And to learn how to talk and slow. <laughs> the problem I had was that I think in paragraphs, and they all try to come out at the same time. So for the first, up till sixth grade, seventh grade, a little bit of eighth grade, I would go like, D -d 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 so don't laugh at me when I stutter. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. And then... The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. What the author is doing, he's drawing a contrast here. In the past, they, God revealed himself through prophets. It was mediated in various ways at various times. The Phillips translation has, in the past, they had glimpses of the truth. But now, the revelation of God isn't mediated. He sent his own son. In the book of Hebrews, and that's true of the entire New Testament, to say son of God is not to say not God. It's to say God in his revelatory mode. God as this human being. God, in other words, God has come in person. They got glimpses of the truth back then, but now we've got the son himself. If you're outside and you're getting glimpses of the son, S-U-N, it's a pretty cloudy day. But now the son himself, the son itself has come, and we see who he really is. And so in the past, they had approximation of God's character, but now we, 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 we've, we've, we see the very character of God. The Son is the exact likeness, is, is the radiance of God's glory, first he says. And think about that term. But what's the difference between radiance and glory? Not much. But what the author is saying is, Jesus is the shininess of God's shininess. When God displays God's own self, it looks like Jesus Christ. He's a perfect revelation of God. And then he says that he is the, the, uh, the, the character, or the exact likeness of God's very being. They got glimpses of, of God's actions and character in the past, but the Son reveals God's very, he uses this word, hypostasis, which means essence. 
So the very essence of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. He's not one revelation among others. There's only one sun, and if it's a cloudy day, you get glimpses of him, and if there's no clouds, you see what the sun's really like. Um, and, and, and so also, insofar as anyone got a true revelation of God, they were seeing the same thing we see. We just see it a lot more clearly. Uh, the clouds have now disappeared. We see who he was really like. In fact, Jesus says that all Scripture points to him. It's all about him. John 5, uh, 39 through 45. He says that, he says the Pharisees, you study the Scriptures dilig dil diligently, and yet you don't come to me to find life, but I'm the life of Scripture. If you're reading the Bible in any other way, other than to find the life that is found in Jesus Christ, you're not reading it correctly. You can know every verse, can, can know it in its original language, have it all down pat, but it won't do you any good unless it's giving you life, and life is found in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says, if you would have believed in Moses and the prophets, you would have believed in me, because they wrote about me. So it all points to Jesus. And more specifically, it points to uh, the crucifixion. Not as, when I say the cross, don't, I don't mean an event separate from the life of Jesus. I mean the event that summarizes and weaves together everything Jesus is about. It's the culminating expression of, of who Jesus is. That's why Jesus said in John 12 that uh, when I'm lifted up, that's when I'll glorify the Father. This is the hour in which I glorify the Father. It was always true that he glorified the Father. It's always true that he revealed the Father. It was always true that Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. Okay, that was always true, but you see it most clearly on the cross. Um, this is the character of God. God is cross-like love down to the very core of his being. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul says that Jesus was crucified and, and rose from the dead according to Scripture. As N.T. Wright points out in his new great book called The Day the Revolution Began, Paul isn't saying that there's like four or five verses that point to this. The whole trajectory of Scripture culminates and is fulfilled in uh, the cross summarizing all of Jesus' life. So everything in the Bible is supposed to point towards uh, Jesus' cross-centered ministry. So if that's the case, then the last thing we should ever do is be holding onto pictures of God that are, are, are in competition with, and maybe even contradictory to, what we find about, what we learn about God in Jesus Christ. Rather, to just take Jesus' own hermeneutic, we should be looking at all of the Old Testament through the lens of the cross because it's all there to point to the cross. So every portrait is supposed to point to Jesus' crucifixion. It can't be in competition with him, let alone contradicting him. But here's the problem. Jesus himself endorses the Old Testament. It permeates everything he's about. He uses scripture says and God says interchangeably. And if he's Lord, then I feel I have no choice but to believe what he believed. If he's Lord, I can't really correct his theology, I don't think. Uh, you know, Jesus said, why do you uh, call me Lord and yet don't do the things that I command you to do? But he could have also said, why do you call me Lord and yet don't believe the things that I believe? And so I have to accept all this as divinely inspired. I, I believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible. The whole thing is, is divinely inspired. And yet, there are portraits of God in the Old Testament that seem to flatly contradict what we learn about God in Jesus Christ. Uh, probably the most macabre portrait of God is, is found when, when in Deuteronomy 7 and other places when he says to Moses, he's depicted as saying to Moses, go and have the Israelites slaughter, destroy, utterly destroy. The word there is harim. Um, everyone say harim. Then I feel good. Learning uh, Hebrew is just so much fun. You get to use that phlegm clearing stuff. So, um, uh, and the concept there is go slaughter them, man, men, women, children, babies, and even, even the animals. Um, although in Deuteronomy 22 it specifies don't kill the trees. They haven't done anything to deserve that, which I think would apply to animals and babies too, wouldn't it? But there's the question. So, Jesus tells us to, to, to love the little children and, and whoever causes the little child to stumble. Uh, it would be better for a milestone to be wrapped around their neck. And he, he prays for mercy at, at his last breath on the cross. But here, God says, show no mercy. In fact, there's a couple passages that threaten people if, they, if they're lax on swinging the sword. If, if you're not killing sufficiently, uh, you could be punished by, by Yahweh. And the thing about harim is that 
it wasn't just utterly it wasn't just about utterly destroying a people group, but it was about doing it as an act of worship. It's to consecrate to God this people group, and you're going to utterly destroy them. So how, the question then is, is how does a portrait of God like that, and there's a lot of them in there, there's over a thousand uh, violent depictions of God, how does a portrait like that point to the cross, the self-sacrificial, other-oriented, non-violent, enemy-embracing love of God that's revealed on the cross? That's the question. It's not about how to, how to make God look a little nicer or explain why he had to do that. The challenge that we have is to understand how all scripture, including these violent portraits of God, bear witness to, 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 to Jesus Christ. So we've got three options here so far as I can see. One, you could say, well, I guess God is kind of like Jesus, but he's also genocidal and, you know, it's a mystery. But see, that I submit to you is not being faithful to Jesus. To trust in Jesus is to trust that he's the full, complete, definitive, unsurpassable revelation of God. He culminates and supersedes all previous revelations. They had shadows, we have the reality. They had cloudy day, we have the sun himself. Or second option is you could just say, don't worry about it. Dismiss. That was a primitive view, and, and uh, you can just skip over those parts. And there's a lot of folks doing that today. But I submit to you that that is also unfaithful to Jesus, because if he's Lord, we have to believe what he believed, and he clearly believed the Old Testament was the inspired word of God. The third option is the one I'm recommending for us this morning. By the way, this is my way of working through an issue. Uh, it's not doctrine. This, is, this does not represent the views of Friends University um, or the Apprentice Institute. So feel free to, if, if the shoe fits, wear it. If you got something better, let me know about it because <laughs> I would like to consider it. But so, so the third option is this. It is to trust Jesus completely and to assume that something else must be going on. Something else is going on. And that something else, I submit to you, will show us how a portrait of God commanding genocide points to the cross. So for me, that something else began to get clear about 12 years ago, I guess it was, when, and now you're going to see my lovely artwork. The workshops have already seen it. They know that I'm a Van Gogh. So now it's the rest of you can enjoy this. Oh, that's cool. You have an automatic pen holder there. Very nice. So here's the cross. And the, I began to understand what that something else was that's going on when I asked this question. We learned about the importance of questions yesterday. Here's a question that I had never heard anyone ask before. I'd never asked it before. But the moment I asked it, I wondered, how is it that I've never asked that before? It seems like the most obvious question in the world. And the question is this. How does the cross, Jesus hanging on the cross, the cross understood as the, the through line of Jesus' whole ministry, how does that reveal God to us? How is it the definitive revelation of God to us? Um, so if you took, like, Uncle Joe, unbeliever, here's Uncle Joe, unbeliever, okay, he's looking at the cross. He, he's not a believer. Oh, no, he, he's sad because he doesn't know Jesus. So here, okay, so that's Uncle Unbeliever. Uh, when he looks at the cross, it's not a definitive revelation. He doesn't see God there. What he sees is a crucified criminal, just one of the many people that Rome put to death. No God there. So what does, what does, uh, what does, what should we call this person? Uh, uh, Betty the Believer, and she's happy because well, they all have bodies here. Okay. okay, so there. I told you it was good. Would she, like, how, how does the cross become the definitive revelation of God for Betty the Believer? Well, she's seeing the same thing that the unbeliever is seeing on one level. She's seeing a crucified criminal. But she sees something else going on. If you're a believer, you're seeing this. You maybe have never thought about it, but you're looking through the cross. And by faith, see, this is what the natural eye can see. That's why an unbeliever or a believer sees the same thing. That's a natural way of looking at things. But you, by faith, look through the cross, and you see that it's God who stepped into this. By faith, you accept the, the message of, 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 of the gospel that Paul preaches when he says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And it's the fact that the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, was, would be willing to stoop this distance and take on this appearance and become our sin and become our curse. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Galatians 3.13, he becomes our curse, which means that God went as far as God could possibly go 
out of love for us. God actually experiences his own antithesis, the all-holy God becoming sin. And the perfectly united God experiencing separation from himself. That's what the curse is. And so in all eternity, God couldn't go one centimeter further than God actually went out of love for us. And the unsurpassable distance that God crosses to be in relationship with us reveals the unsurpassable perfection of the love that God is. Actually, it's the greatest love story ever told. It couldn't be a greater distance cross or a greater love revealed than the love that's revealed on Calvary. That's why John says, God is love, and he defines love by putting us to the cross. So you look through the surface. The surface of this is ugly, it's hideous, because we know that it mirrors our sin, the ugliness of sin, and the ugliness of the judgment of sin, the consequences of sin. The surface is ugly. But the believer, unlike the, believe, uh, the unbeliever, the believer looks through the ugly surfaces to behold the, beauty, the beautiful God. It's, it's, so th this is faith perception, and this is natural perception. And so the cross is for the believer both revoltingly ugly on the surface, but radiantly beautiful, unsurpassably beautiful in its depth. It's revolting beauty. Now, if the cross reveals what God is really like, it reveals what God's always been like, including what God was like when he breathed scripture. And since all scripture is there for the ultimate purpose of pointing us to and bringing us into relationship with the crucified Christ, shouldn't we ask the question, where else might we find God revealing himself this way? This is who God is. He's a God who stoops to bear the sin of his people, and to take on an appearance that reflects the ugliness of that sin. Where else might God do this? If the cross reveals what God's really like, it can't be a one-off event. This is revealing what God always is like. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13. So uh, I submit to you, we're asking the question, where else might we find God looking ugly on the surface? Because he's bearing the sin of his people, so where else might we find depictions of God where we have to look through the ugly surface to behold the beautiful God who was willing to stoop this distance to stay in relationship with his people? Um, and I submit to you that all of the sub-Christ-like depictions of God in the Bible should be interpreted in this way. Uh, he's a God who reveals his beauty by taking on the ugliness of human sin and therefore taking on an appearance of the ugliness of human sin. The, the surface doesn't reveal what God is like in and of itself. If it did, we'd have to conclude, conclude that God is profoundly ugly. What reveals God to us is that we, by faith, look through the cross to see, oh, the triangle, by the way, is God, Trinity. I, I assume you all got that. So um, we should read the Bible knowing, if we trust that this is really what God is like, how about we read the Bible knowing that sometimes God reveals his beauty by stooping to bear the ugliness of, of, of people? Where else might we need to exercise faith to look through the surface to see there's something else that is going on? In all of these depictions, the violent depictions of God in the Old Testament, um, I think we're in the situation that I was, that I would be if I saw my wife acting bizarrely and cruelly on the other side of the street. Trusting that God really is loving and beautiful and all of that, I assume something else must be going on. And this, the, the something else that's going on in the violent depictions of God in the Bible is exactly the same thing that's going on at the cross, when the cross becomes the definitive revelation of, uh, of God for us. He's a God who's always been willing to meet his people where they're at, to stoop down to their level, uh, to embrace them as they are, uh, including their, 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 their mental conceptions of God, and um, loving them as he is. He, he accommodates that, because he's not gonna coercively do a lobotomy on people so they think all the right thoughts. Uh, that, that's not the kind of power God relies on. The cross is the power of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. And that, that's a, the power of, the influential power of love. That's, that's the kind of power that God exercises. So he respects people's personhood, he doesn't lobotomize their brains so they think through thoughts, which means he has to accept them as they are and accommodate them as they are in order to keep on moving them more in the direction that he would like them to, 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 to go. And this is why what you find throughout the Old Testament is this. These authors will ascribe violence to God and they'll depict God in violent terms. But if you read their own writings carefully, you'll find out that God isn't the one that actually did the violence. There's other humans or other cosmic agents that are involved in this violence. The only thing that God does 
to bring about a judgment, is he withdraws. He turns people over, which is what, what the Father does on the cross. Uh, all the violence that happened to Jesus was done by human beings working under the influence of, of these, uh, the kingdom of darkness. Um, and, and the only thing the Father did was turn him over, Paul says several times. God gave him over, because this was part of the divine plan. God judges by, I think God stays in the game to protect us from the negative consequences, the destructive consequences of our sin, because sin is inherently destructive. But if it ever gets to the point where that's just enabling us to sink deeper into our sin, God has no choice but to let us go and, and um, let us suffer the consequences of our sin. And he does that, hoping that we'll learn the hard way what we didn't learn the merciful way. And some of you who have had drug-addicted loved ones, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you, you stay in there as long as you can to protect them. There's a, there's a time that you have to just kind of let them go. It's also why in, in the, 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 the biblical authors often apply the same violent verbs to God and to people. Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially do this a lot. Uh, they'll say, they'll, they'll depict God as saying, I'm going to smash families together, children and, and parents alike. But then they say the same thing about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who invaded uh, 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 Israel. And the reason they're doing this, the primary reason, I mean, this is their mental conception of God. That's just where they were, and so God has to accommodate that, meet them where they're at. But it's also the case that in the ancient Near East, which is the cultural context of, of ancient Israel, ascribing violence to your God was the highest form of praise. All the people do this. They, they know that they, are, they engage in the violence, but they don't take the credit for it. They, 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 they credit God. And, and the more macabre the violence and the grosser the violence, uh, the more you're praising God. And so they have like the contest with each other. Our God is greater than your God because our God... Well, they'll eat your children alive and spit out their bones and dance in their blood. Uh, and you find things like that in, in the Bible, in the Psalms, about, you know, how the righteous will dance in the blood of the wicked and things like that. Uh, so given that, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the others, they'll attribute violence to God, and they think they're praising God in doing that, even though they know that God didn't actually do any of the violence. All the violence that happened to Israel, for example, uh, came from Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, not God. God simply turned them over. Uh, and to let, it, to let this happen. All God, I think, ever does is withdraw. So let me give you one example of this. Let's go to the, the, the show no mercy, because I didn't talk about that in the workshops yet. How should we interpret this passage? Show no mercy, slaughter every man, woman, child, baby, and even the animals. Anything that breathes, leave nothing alive that breathes. How should we interpret it? I submit to you, submit to you that the surface of that text, which you can get by strictly exegetical means, uh, is profoundly ugly and inconsistent with the revelation of God in Christ. The Jesus who told us to love the little children, let the little children come unto me, uh, don't cause them to stumble, and he prays for our forgiveness. I can't imagine Jesus under any circumstances saying, hey, you guys, go out and slaughter that whole people group, exterminate them as an act of worship to me. I can't imagine that. And so I will regard, the surface doesn't tell me what God's like. The surface tells me what the people of God are like at the time. They are thinking in terms of just they're thinking very much like all other ancient Near Eastern people. In fact, when you find beautiful depictions of God in the Old Testament, they stand out in contrast with everything everyone else is saying about God. But when they depict God as a heavenly warrior, those depictions are very much on a par with what everyone else is saying about God. In fact, sometimes they even take songs that were sung to a pagan God, a warrior God, lift the song, switch out their God, and put in Yahweh. So it shows you that they're being culturally conditioned. So you learn a lot about the sin that God is bearing with his people at this time when you come upon a portrait of God like that. But if you trust that Jesus really reveals what God's totally like without remainder, then you look through that and marvel at the fact that God was willing to stoop this far down to stay in relationship with these people, to continue to work in them, to move them forward, and ultimately to reach the world through these people. God was willing to do this. So behind the ugly depictions of God, like show no mercy, slaughter them all. We should see the beauty of a God who is willing to accept the people who thought he was capable of this. Um, now, going along with that, we have to look at a few other considerations on this that I think reinforce this. Um, we, we, we trust that something else is going on behind the genocidal portrait of God. And what's going on behind all these portraits is exactly what's going on. There's something else that's going on on, on, on the cross. Uh, God always promised the Israelites, if you trust me, I'll fight your battles, you won't have to fight. 
You won't have to use the sword. So the fact that they invaded the the land of Canaan using the sword in a ruthless, genocidal way tells you that they were already outside the will of God. They weren't trusting God, because otherwise they wouldn't have had to do it that way. Um, We have to ask this question. They trusted Moses, but should we? And I know this sounds so radical, but listen to this. Uh, Moses is the only one who claims to have gotten this command from God. It's it's, It's given or carried out 37 times in the Old Testament. It all comes from Moses. When Joshua carries it out, he says, do this on the authority of Moses who heard from Yahweh. But should should, should that be enough for us? Paul said in Galatians 1 that if anyone preaches a gospel other than what we've preached, even if it looks like an angel of light, let them be anathema, let them be accursed. Well, I submit to you that the idea that God would want you to engage in genocide and exterminate entire people groups is about as contrary to the gospel as you could get. So I feel I have warrant here for saying, no, that wasn't God. Moses, that's you. That, 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 that's on you. So I submit that that itself is the reason why we shouldn't uh, put the trust in, in, in that. The final thing, and see, we, we, when you start looking at the Bible through the lens of the cross, because it's all supposed to point to that, you start to notice things you never noticed before. I never noticed this before. Maybe you haven't either. But there's several places where we find God giving nonviolent plans on how to enter the land of Canaan. Uh, for example... He says in Exodus 23, I will send my terror in front of you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send the pestilence, insects, in front of you, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Termites and everyone else from you. So he's saying, I'm I'm, I'm going to make this too pesty for them. They're they're, they're, going to get uncomfortable and they'll migrate off the land. But he says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, or the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply against you. Little by little, I'll drive them out from before you until you have increased and and, and, and can possess the land. Now that sounds like a little more Jesus way of doing things, doesn't it? Uh, Yeah, just increase the insects. They're going to get, they'll naturally migrate. I'll do it slowly. It's going to be a gradual thing. What happened to that plan? you from, I'm, I'm going to make, make it too pe- pesty for him, too buggy for him. And all of a sudden now it's, slaughter them all, men, women, children, babies, and include the animals, but spare the trees. What happened? Or here's another one. Just give one more. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, for by all these practices the nations I am casting out before you, he's going to cast it out, have defiled themselves. Thus the land became defiled, and I punished it for its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. And here the Lord, it's a mode of speech where you speak about a future thing as though it was already passed. And so here the plan is, I'm going to, uh, the land will vomit them out. Probably meaning I'll dry, it won't be productive. It, 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 they won't have success in agriculture, so they'll naturally migrate off it. What happened to that plan? I submit to you that, I mean, maybe God just all of a sudden had a change of mind and got in a bad mood and said slaughter them all. But I, if I trust Jesus... I have to assume that something else is going on here. And I, I, here's one way of thinking about it. I think God did tell Moses, I'm giving you this land. Um, but what Moses hears, what any ancient Near Eastern person would hear is, oh, we're supposed to go slaughter them. Because I, I, that's what it meant to take someone's land in the ancient Near East. And there's plenty of examples of people believing that God helped them slaughter the inhabitants so they could acquire the land. But no one ever dreamed of, 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 of trusting a God who would give you the land without needing to slaughter anybody. So I submit to you that God says, I give you the land, but Moses hears, oh, we're supposed to slaughter them and exterminate them. Um, and God, because God won't lobotomize Moses or contr- manipulate his brain cells to believe the true thing, there comes a point, he'll influence as much as possible, but there comes a point where he has to just accept you as you are. Uh, even though it's going to make him look bad in the narrative of his mission, missionary activity, which is written by his children. Um, but he puts up with this. He, he, he's a God who's not above coming down to this level. I'll close with this. All this is about God accommodating us where we're at, loving us as we are, in order to keep working with us to become all that he knows we can become. And I've looked for analogies of this all over the place, and someone sent me this one, and it's just beautiful. Um, it, 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 there's a couple that works in a Christian foster home that takes in only severely abused children. And in this home, they have a, 
uh, an incarnational philosophy where they believe that you first have to get on the inside of a child and understand why they're doing a behavior before you try to correct the behavior. So they get this little girl, I'll name her Susie. Uh, she's a 10-year-old girl, and the first night she stays there, when they come in the morning, oops, when they come in in the morning to uh, check on her, her walls were covered with her feces, poop. And I suppose a lot of people there would, would go, oh, that's disgusting, that's repulsive, that's re rebellious behavior, and would have disciplined her. But see, these folks, they, they rightly concluded that if she did this, there must be a reason for it. We don't know what it is, but she must feel the need to do this, so they made a deal with her. She could smear her poop on this one part of one wall instead of the whole room. And they said, if, if you need to do this, we don't understand it, but, but, but we love you, and we're going to work with you, and so you can have this part of the wall. And, and so she would do that every night. She'd smear her poop on that section of the wall. And in the morning, the workers would come in and uh, with her would clean, help clean it up. Over time, she, they won the trust of this young lady, Susie. And, and um, Susie opened up to them as to what was going on. It turns out she had been sexually abused by her usually drunk father in the middle of the night since the age of four. And one time during the sexual abuse, she accidentally defecated. And her father was revolted, disgusted with this, and so bolted out of the room. And little four-year-old Susie, or six-year-old Susie, I guess, when, when this happened, she gets a clever idea. I know how to keep fa father away from me. And so she would smear poop on the walls. And to us, the smell of that poop would be disgusting, but to her, that's what security smelled like. That, that, that's what safety smelled like, and she couldn't go to sleep without it. Hence, where she had to smear the poop. And when the, the, this team learned about this, they said to her, you're a very, very smart young lady. And as long as you feel the need to do that, we want to affirm that. In fact, we'll help you do it. And so a worker would put on latex gloves, come in there, and help her smear the poop on the wall. The next morning, come and, and, and clean it up. Now imagine, imagine if, if you were a social worker and you came to check on the house, and you find a worker kneeling next to a girl smearing her poop on the wall. You would say that's revolting, that's disgusting, called Child Protective Services. This is abusive. It looks terribly ugly. But if you knew the character of the people who were doing it, if you saw what else was going on, if you knew the whole story, it becomes beautiful. It becomes beautiful. It's a beautiful story. It's revoltingly beautiful, revolting on the surface. But if you know what else is going on, it becomes beautiful. Uh, folks, this is what God does with us on the cross. He dives headlong into our poop. Uh, he becomes it. He loves us in the midst of our poop because he wants to eventually grow us out of our poop. And, and he he's, says the cross reveals what God's always been like. He's always been doing this. And, and so what I see when, when I find crappy pictures of God in the Bible, yeah, they're crappy. Go ahead and name them crappy. Um, but don't, don't stop there. Look what else is going on. And what else is going on is the exact same thing that went on at the cross. A God who's willing to stoop to any distance necessary to reveal his beauty to us, uh, to work with us, to move us to where he wants us to be. Welcome.